All right, cool. Um, first of all, thank you guys all for coming here. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about OpenStack at Two Sigma, a quantitative investment management company in New York City. My name is Zhu Chen, also go by Simon. I currently manage a very talented group of engineers to leverage OpenStack as the building block to build a large-scale, high-performance, and highly available private cloud to support a diverse set of workloads here at Two Sigma. So in case some of you don't know about Two Sigma, um, it's a company that was founded in 2001 by a statistician and a computer scientist, um, John Overdeck and David Siegel, with the goal of applying cutting-edge technology to the data-rich world of finance, with, which provides a fertile ground for exploration. We have vast amount of data, fast feedback, and unbounded opportunity. We currently have about 750 employees, and over 500 of them are actually software engineers. And together, we manage about 25 billion assets globally. So as a technology company, Two Sigma has a fairly large compute infrastructure that, that are deployed across multiple data centers in the United States. So before we started the OpenStack project, we, had a already, we already had a fairly sophisticated build system that can consistently and automatically deliver physical machines of, from a variety of vendors to application owners. I mean, but the drawback of this particular system is very obvious. I mean, like very long turnaround time and then the lack of sharing across different applications. So we decided to, I mean, we really wanted to leverage the latest and greatest cloud technology to revitalize our infrastructure and address those problems. And at the same time, we want to push our application owners to rebuild and or build more um, applications are distributed, scale out, and that's suitable for the cloud and cut ties to the physical infrastructure entirely. So when we decided to build a private cloud, obviously there were a number of options available, OpenStack being one, and CloudStack, Eucalyptus. Um, I mean, back in 2001, 2013, it was, OpenStack was already a pretty clear leader. And I can tell you, honestly, after 18 months of working on this project, um, we had, honestly, no regret going with OpenStack at all. Well, today, it's more about, today I'm going to talk to you about the journey that we have been through. I mean, I kind of just mentioned a little bit how we get started. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about where we are now, and hopefully, in the end, a little bit about where we hope to, where we hope to get next. Okay? Oops. One second. All right, so before I kind of go to more of the technical details about our cloud deployments, I do want to mention a few things about enterprise cloud integration. So what does it really mean to build a private enterprise cloud versus building a public cloud? So the, the biggest difference between public cloud and like private cloud is probably policy control, right? If you think about the public cloud, it's like the wild, wild west. Everyone can do whatever they want. Um, everyone has root, and then if you want to roll your images, sure, feel free to do that. Private cloud is more about policy controls. You want to make sure that people can do what they want, but also under certain rules. So, I mean, I'm not going to talk too much about all these things, but it's essentially in our environment, no one has root. You cannot roll your own images. You cannot install arbitrary packages. And what I do want to mention is that even with the existing OpenStack framework, it's actually very easy to kind of enforce all those enterprise policy controls simply by customizing, for example, policy.json for each individual OpenStack components. The second difference is probably the level of expectation for your cloud users. On the public cloud, essentially, you get a set of API documents, you are given a forum to bitch about things, and then when actually VMs are really slow, I mean, well, tough luck. But for the private cloud, it's more, there's more hand-holding involved in the sense that you do want your application owners to, success, to succeed because in, in, in return, they actually, that's a success story for your private cloud as well. So, I mean, just quoting Jonathan like, from the keynote, we're trying to maximize our developer like, productivity by uh, actually doing things better on the cloud. So, I mean, so in case there are problems with uh, performance problems or any reason that application owners can't get their application to work better on the cloud, you do want to help them. I mean, because in the end, in return, it's going to drive cloud adoption. And the final key difference is the level of integration. 
I mean, if you go to any kind of um, decent sized enterprise, usually there are already uh, very strict ways in terms of user, user authentication. There is probably an existing network infrastructure with existing IP address spacing, uh, space design, and routing policy defined. And at Two Sigma, we already have a pretty decent um, software ecosystem where allow, which allows developers to easily and quickly build, test, deploy software. I mean, you don't want to really build your private cloud in a complete silo so that it kind of smells and feels like the public cloud because you want to make your private cloud really an integral part of your entire ecosystem. And therefore, it makes it, I mean, if you spin up a VM, it's nothing different from existing physical machines except it's faster to spin up and you can get more of them. So, I mean, that kind of really helps you kind of drive your cloud um, de deployment. So, at a uh, very high level, maybe 30,000 feet, um, we deploy, our de cloud deployment is probably similar to most others. We have multiple data centers in the United States, and we deploy um, cloud into many of them. And uh, we, ch we deploy multiple availability zones in each of the data centers. And then we ensure that for every availability zone, there's no single point failure um, across, uh, within that zone. So one thing I do want to mention is that we chose to make an availability zone an entire, entirely separate OpenStack deployment. So nothing is shared across different availability zones. I mean, there are probably a gazillion ways to deploy OpenStack right now, um, but we made this decision for a number of reasons. First of all, I mean, we, what we found is actually pretty surprising, not quite surprising, is that software are actually much, uh, it's much kind of less reliable than hardware. So when you have multiple availability zones actually depend on the same software components, let's say the RabbitMQ or something like that, it doesn't really make much sense. You will have unforeseen failures from time to time. Secondly, we try to, I mean, as we're trying to leverage like cutting edge technology, we try to do something slightly different for every new zone we build. And as a result, I mean, if you actually kind of completely isolate different availability zones, this allows us to try something new. Because, I mean, essentially it's a new environment, uh, fewer users, and then essentially it's much larger scale deployment than a regular lab, lab environment. And finally, if we can ensure that each availability zone are completely isolated from each other, we can do like planned maintenance much easier, right? Because we can tell user with a strict face that we're gonna maintain this particular zone and no one, nothing else is gonna be impacted so you can steer your workload away from that particular zone. Um, so, I mean, this, I mean, this design makes some sense, uh, makes sense in, um, in many ways, but it also brings a, a list of challenges. One challenge, of course, is on the infrastructure side, because now as a cloud engineering team, we have to build and manage multiple zones at the same time. Um, we solve this problem, obviously, through automation. So we use Ansible. Um, assuming all the hardware is in place, we can essentially bring up an entire zone, may maybe within less than a day. Um, and we also, I mean, although even though we try to keep all of our production zones consistent, so even though we do something new in the new zone, then we use run the same Ansible play to upgrade existing zones so that all the zones are the same. Um, essentially, but there's also, this kind of setup also brings some cost in terms of user experience because right now user had to remember multiple API endpoints, multiple Horizon dashboards to go with multiple zones. So we built many software artifacts to help users to navigate through multiple zones, which I'm gonna talk about in, in, in a little bit. All right, so how do users get access to OpenStack or uh, private cloud? So at Two Sigma, we have a fairly sophisticated configuration management database, which literally calls CMDB. So what happens is that when a user, when a, let's say a new employee, Alice, comes on board, uh, a, a new user entity and a corporal's principle are created. And then as Alice joins certain projects, let's say big data, there's gonna be some association saying this user is part of that user group. What we do is to run a, um, a, a cron job that synchronizes information from CMDB periodically into OpenStack, in particular Keystone instances of every availability zone. So what's gonna happen is that each user group in CMDB is gonna to map to a tenant or project in Keystone, and then the user's Kerberos credential is gonna become a user in, in, in OpenStack. And then obviously the membership can be established pretty easily. Um, so remember, I mean, this is something that kind of happens automatically in the background, so no kind of manual intervention is really needed. So as the user comes on board, she's gonna launch, let's say, a VM called Hadoop 1 on top of OpenStack. 
what we do is to have another process called TweetyBird, which kind of listens on this uh, notification queue of RabbitMQ, such that it will synchronously register the fully qualified domain name into our DNS system, and then push kind of, let's say, now you have a new VM into CMDB, so that now you have a centralized place to search all your VMs. I mean, the reason we kind of do this is that we want to make sure, I mean, the reason we want to kind of synchronize all the information into Keystone instead of letting Keystone to query the outside system is because, I mean, what if CMDB goes down? I mean, what if your LDAP server goes down? We don't want to have that kind of dependency in this way. So, I mean, all right. So, I mean, how do, um, in many kind of enterprises, and, and, and in particular in the finance uh, world, Kerberos is kind of the de facto authentic user authentication story. So the idea is that when, every time when a user logs onto a workstation, and you are given, you're kind of, sta there, a, a Kerberos ticket is stashed onto the local file system. And then essentially the user used that same Kerberos ticket to request access to like all the existing other services. So we want to kind of extend the same kind of password list um, authentication experience for users. So what we do is to kind of customize Keystone. We wrote our own Kerberos authentication plugin and make it part of the uh, paste pipeline. So what happens is that we modify all the OpenStack clients to prefer Kerberos authentication first to go to Keystone and get a token back, and then you can use the same token to talk to other vanilla OpenStack services. Um, Horizon is a little bit more tricky because essentially, let's say, when you open up a browser, you want to kind of fire up, you want to go to Horizon, What's gonna happen is that when, since the user is not authenticated yet, Horizon is gonna kick back a redirect uh, so that the user would then go to Keystone um, to do Kerberos authentication, and then after that, Keystone will kick the user back to Horizon, except that the URL now has a token embedded such that it can proceed and just recognize the user. So re just remember that all of these does not require any user interaction. I mean, it just happens automatically in the back, like when, like, uh, with a number of requests in the browser. So from a user perspective, if you fire up Horizon, essentially you're already recognized as who you are, and then you have the list of projects to, um, that you can have access to. So it's pretty kind of seamless integration. Um, I mean, what I just talked about kind of addressed the single sign on or password list authentication problem. But again, people still have to remember the Keystone URL or maybe the Horizon Dashboard URL. We want to kind of even free them from that. So what we have here is essentially we build, custom build a in-house kind of a simple web service called Cloud API. So it's essentially just like web service running on multiple VMs across different OpenStack availability zones behind this like load balancer, just like anyone should build a web application. So what you can do here is to use, like, for example, negotiate as you use Kerberos authentication. You can just talk to the single API and say, I want to launch, let's say, three VMs in this big data project in this particular zone. And then Cloud API would actually take this request and talk to the appropriate zone in the back end for the particular user. So it's kind of just make it a single entry point for user to interact with our cloud. And obviously, everyone likes dashboard more than APIs. Um, we're in the process of building our own dashboard. So as you can see here, it makes things even simpler. So you can actually say, I want to launch uh, one VM in one zone, another VM in a different zone, and then you click of a button, then essentially kind of go, this um, dashboard would talk to Cloud API in the background to talk to multiple zones. So you can kind of launch multiple VMs across multiple zones in one shot. Um, there is actually a simplified view, which just allow the user to say, I want five VMs, and we can schedule wherever we want for the user to make it just, pretty much um, one click for launching of VMs. All right, so um, besides APIs and GUIs, we also have done quite a few customization to allow people to navigate across multiple availability zones. For example, one thing that we do found very useful is a maintenance API. For some of our workload, it's actually pretty computational intensive like batch processing job, which may take tens of hours to finish. I mean, it's not a good idea to actually schedule that kind of job into availability zone, which you know is gonna have some maintenance, scheduled maintenance events. So what we have is kind of a simple API that can let the batch schedule, the job batch, oh, sorry, the job, uh, the batch job scheduling, uh, scheduler to query and then to decide, okay, if this zone is gonna enter maintenance, I'm gonna sort of schedule my batch job somewhere else. Um, 
as you as most people as most people know, the security group in term, the security group is a good way to enforce kind of cross VM communication patterns. But the problem with security group is that it only kind of is limited to one particular zone, right? So if you want to have an application, a cluster spanning multiple zones, then you kind of, it's pretty tricky and cumbersome to set up security group correctly. So what we do is to kind of uh, allow people to enter security, uh, security groups uh, like rules inside of CMDB, and then we kind of, in the background, synchronize those rules back into each individual zones to make it much easier for people to um, play with. And we also, for load balancer as a service, I mean, OpenStack has one, but it's also limited to a particular availability zone and a particular tenant. So what we do is build our own custom layer so that we can actually load balance into any zones, any, any machines you want, and even including the physical machines. So what, I mean, what this comes, I mean, the benefit, of course, is that now people can gradually kind of shift cloud resource into their existing applications and gradually phase out physical machines to make it much easier to shift to the cloud. Oops. All right, so enough about user access. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our highly available deployment strategies. So, I mean, um, probably many people are already doing this, but our philosophy is to deploy three instances of every piece of software and make sure that they, are, uh, they, fail, they can fail somewhat independent of each other. So, I mean, some, uh, we use, let's say, uh, RabbitMQ in cluster mode for, with HAQs. Uh, and database, we use MariaDB with Glara. So, I mean, and also for every piece of OpenStack services, we make sure that we run three instances and behind a load balancer in that way. So in this, and, and, and in reality, what happens is that we, in every availability zone, we have three controller kind of physical machines, which we run multiple VMs on top of, and then we guarantee that, let's say, Nova API is actually scheduled on two different VMs across different physical machines. So even if we lose an entire rack or lose that control VM, not, really nothing matters. Um, all right, network. This is actually gonna be a fun piece to talk about. Um, we started using um, uh, Open vSwitch plugin from, uh, uh, with Neutron from the get-go. Um, I mean, although some, many people are actually holding on to Nova Network. Um, we, use, um, we use Open vSwitch plus VXLAN tunneling, for example. And then sort of later on, we switched to ML2 plugin, but still with Open vSwitch, uh, Open vSwitch driver. So we actually um, heavily customized this solution. We solved the performance problem by and doing, but enabling multi-queue and libvert, and actually we do um, some, quite a few um, open vSwitch customization, and then using special large network hardware to accelerate uh, the performance. So we can actually essentially get, like, basically using the regular 1500 MTU, can get 15 gigabit per second between VMs across different hypervisors. So, I mean, with the performance problem out, the HA, sort of, Neutron does not provide a very good HA story. So, um, Essentially, we had to kind of um, design our own HA solution. Um, before I talk about that, actually, I do, want to, I do want to mention that, I mean, because of the enterprise security restriction, uh, we cannot reuse like, like overlapping IP addresses, so every VM actually get a real two sigma IP addresses that is globally reachable from our internal network, and there's no really floating IP addresses. In some, in some sense, it makes our design somewhat easier. So here is just one example of a, what a tenant network look like. So what happens is that whenever someone creates a network, we're gonna create two logical routers, which are gonna take dot two and dot three within the subnet, and then we inject KeepAlive D instances into those namespaces so that they can negotiate who's gonna be the dot one gateway to take care of the outbound traffic for the VMs. Um, I mean, there is probably, there are actually some supporting Keep Alive, like, of Keep Alive D right now in Neutron, but I mean, remember we did this like 18 months ago. Uh, and we're actually gonna keep using this because of some flexibility it gives us about uh, rolling upgrades, which I'm gonna talk about in a bit. So here's the more complete picture, right? So once you have a subnet, then you, have, you create two logical routers. What we do is to plug those two logical routers into two separate external networks. And then we guarantee that the two different external networks are associated to different top of rack switches. So in this case, um, what's gonna happen is that the logical router is gonna be scheduled to the layer three agent associated to uh, that particular rack. And then we ensure that the two kind of logical routers are scheduled onto different racks for, highly, for, for high availability. So in this case, even if we lose an entire rack or lose that logical, um, lose that, um, that particular layer three agent, it doesn't matter. The other one just takes over. 
So what we do additionally is actually to establish, use Quagga to establish a BGP connection between the layer three agent to the top of rack switches so that we can inject all these tenant subnets into the network so that they can actually, the network infrastructure can handle the inbound, can actually forward correctly the inbound traffic towards the right layer three agent for the subnet. Um, yeah, I mean, it worked out pretty well so far. And I mean, we don't actually require, we actually provide a fully HA solution without requiring, let's say, a big ass layer two, like spanning tree across the entire data center. So all the racks are actually fully routed. Um, in terms of like, um, I, there is something that we also do, for example, I mean, um, main, like kind of maintaining or upgrading Neutron is actually pretty painful. I would say that, I mean, pretty much all the OpenStack components are pretty easy to upgrade except for Neutron because it actually kind of hits your um, production traffic. So what we do here is that, I mean, for example, if you want to upgrade this particular physical machine of this layer, running this layer three agent, what we do is kind of just kill all the keep alive D instances so that, I mean, the dot one gateway is gonna ship to somewhere else. And then we kill this BGP connection so that obviously the inbound traffic will flow somewhere else. So essentially we completely dry out the traffic going through this particular uh, layer three agent. And then therefore we can do like kernel upgrades, open vSwitch upgrade, whatever you want. And then after you're done, you can kind of re-enable all those artifacts and therefore the traffic will shift back. So this actually enables us to do a truly kind of hitless uh, rolling upgrade for Neutron components. All right, storage. This is another fun topic. Um, we actually um, decided to use, um, to pr let VMs, to launch VM, uh, to launch um, only with kind of Cinder volumes, uh, which sits on top of Ceph uh, with three replicas. I mean, for a number of reasons. I mean, Ceph is pretty awesome. I mean, with this setup, it allows us to do live migration uh, for the VMs. We actually do this pretty regularly as we kind of do rolling upgrades for our compute certain hypervisors. We do like kernel upgrades and all kinds of things. Um, this actually, um, Ceph also allow us to completely rebuild the cluster. For example, we mistakenly started using like Bcash and ButterFS to build our Ceph cluster and then we kind of swap it out. So essentially we just like completely wipe out a Ceph node and then like install a new kernel, like just basically redo the file system and then just put it back on to let it refill and it just works. We've done this probably, this rebuilding the entire cluster probably two, three times so far. Um, I mean, Ceph is pretty nice and a lot of people are using it, but I mean, my advice is, to people who are thinking of actually running this in production is that you really need to know everything. We had, I mean, I would say that probably 90% of our cloud downtime is actually related to Ceph, surprisingly. Um, you really need to understand every piece and to run it better. So I mean, what we had to do is that we, uh, we had to customize our hardware setup. Like you have to really understand your, your rate card firmware and, and configuration. You have to customize. You have to use newer kernels. There are system control parameters you need to use. Uh, enable jumble frame helps. Like Ceph configuration, Cinder glance configuration, everything. So this is probably a whole nother talk, but it's uh, uh, it's pretty fun. Um, so besides um, Ceph-based storage, which obviously provides the HA story by itself because now it, it's fully replicated, therefore it can tolerate up to two physical machine failures. Um, we recently started offering people um, with the ability to launch VMs with locally attached storage, which is maybe like reverse to what people do. Um, so here uh, with, with locally attached storage, we make it clear to the application owners that, okay, now you lose the ability to live, we lose the ability to live migrate your VM and therefore if there's anything goes wrong with your physical machine, I mean, your, your VM is down for an extended period of time. And most people are okay with it because now they can build app, uh, HA in their application and gets better performance with local storage. All right, so enough about the HA story. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we actually deploy OpenStack into production. So, I mean, you may ask the question, okay, what kind of release you're on? Kilo, Juno, whatever. Uh, well, the short answer is we're not on any particular release. We deploy trunk into production. Um, I mean, to many people this might sound scary, but it's actually okay because if you think about it, um, the core functionality of OpenStack is actually pretty stable. I mean, in, t in terms of launching VMs and then doing like volume attach. I mean, as long as you kind of stay away from those fancy new features, you're generally okay. Um, and in particular, this is kind of a, given that it's a as a private cloud environment, we can just tell users, say, hey, you're not supposed to use those features because it's just not, it's not supported. So this actually allows us to actually uh, use leverage trunk pretty successfully in our, in our environment. 
So, but if you kind of really think about, uh, sort of sit back and think about what we really want, I mean, trunk is just sort of one way, right? But what we really want is to kind of ease, quickly apply our local patches and roll it out into our production environments. And at the same time, has, still has the ability or the option to absorb upstream advances to take advantages of new features or bug fixes, et cetera. So here's a quick picture of kind of our workflow. What's gonna happen is that we always gonna, let's say this is Nova upstream. What we do is that we fork from Nova, uh, from upstream, and then to our local branch. Obviously, let's say provide a local, um, apply a local patch. I mean, it could be some modifications that we do. Obviously, we do a lot of them. Or it could be a patch that is being reviewed upstream, not accepted yet, but we really want to use it. So what's gonna happen is that essentially we're gonna pull in the patch and then form a, a particular point of our local branch. Then there's a Jenkins job which will actually just um, take that particular commit tag and rerun all the unit tests to make sure this component actually builds and runs okay. And obviously sometimes this fails because we messed up. And then you can just apply additional patches. What's gonna happen is that then at a certain point Jenkins job is gonna succeed which actually give you a successful build. At that point, we, can, we have a, a, a sort of an um, in-house software we call Pachyderm, which is sort of somewhat similar to pack and deploy. So what happens is that Pachyderm essentially can take a particular commit tag from a local, brand, a local repo and then pack and create a Python virtual environment to package all the dependencies as well as the code base in question in sort of a separate um, virtual environment. And then what you can do is essentially you kind of tarball it and drop it to an object store. And on any machine which you want to deploy that particular version, you run like Pachyderm deploy, which essentially pulls that object from the um, object store and then just put it into the local file system. And the benefit here of kind of having this virtual environment based uh, deploy is that is you can, let's say, have Nova and Keystone, let's say, deploy in the same machine, but having their own dependencies. And you can also deploy multiple versions of Nova in, on the same machine and then just easily switch between them just by changing some pointers to the virtual, to the virtual end. And then let's, if we go back to the top of the picture, it's essentially periodically we do merge from upstream because if there's something major we want to absorb in. So, it's, so I mean the merge process, I mean sometimes it works, sometimes it fails because obviously if we touch something there could have conflict with upstream. So I mean there could be some sort of manual merge process process going on, but when the merge thing is done, essentially you can apply the same workflow of Jenkins and Pachyderm to, 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 to deploy the new version. All right, so as I mentioned, we use Ansible to deploy, um, to handle the entire deployment flow. So on the left-hand side, you can actually see this sort of each Pachyderm build has a unique UUID associated to it. So for a particular deployment, essentially you just list for all the, say, Nova, Keystone, whatever, what UUID in terms of Pachyderm build you want to use. So if you want to kind of upgrade a particular component to a next version, you just change the UUID and rerun Ansible. Um, this is kind of a role-based tasks, a list of things to do to deploy, let's say, Keystone uh, on the particular machine. So what this means is that it's actually kind of in short, it drops some configuration file based on templates. It actually drops a particular packet and build uh, to make sure the code base is there. And then defines how to run this particular service. In this case, just run keystone-all program. And this is kind of like our entire playbook for deploying Ansible. Uh, so to deploy open keystone with Ansible. So essentially it's gonna run the, the list of role-based tasks first. So drop code base configuration. And then it stop the current services and then perform DB migration, like restart the services, and ensure all the service credentials are, are provisioned. So essentially, it's the same playbook which we use to bootstrap a new environment as well as um, upgrading. So, all right. So next topic, monitoring. In an enterprise kind of private cloud environment, monitoring is absolutely cr critical because you want to understand how things, like how things are going, whether performance is good, and sometimes you want to detect failures when, uh, when people even notice them. Um, you certainly don't want to wait for people to say, hey, your cloud is broken, and you can, then you start looking. So, I mean, there are sort of a list of mundane things that we do, such as like service aliveness checks. Uh, we, have, we use Nagios for checking some sort of regular services like uh, RabbitMQ and MySQL. Um, and then we kind of wrote our custom checks, such as, for example, you want to use a Kubernetes credential to talk to Keystone, get a token back, and then go against like a Nova, let's say. So, I mean, those are the things that we kind of customize um, to make sure everything is working correctly. 
uh, we do periodic, like we have a cron job to periodically deploy VMs into every availability zone to make sure that everything works. I mean, if, if the new VM depo deployment fails for whatever reason, we get an email notification and then we kind of see what's going on. Um, we collect, obviously collect all the logs. We turn on debug logging by default because storage is cheap and the debug log actually gives you more information than you, than you, um, than you would imagine. Uh, and then we kind of put all the data into Elasticsearch and kind of visualize it over time. So here's actually a pretty fun example that we use since we built our custom like um, load balancer layer. What we do is that we actually beam the API response time to Elasticsearch and track it over time. So here's an example. It actually happened last year that after a particular Keystone upgrade, um, the API response time for Keystone just keeps climbing. So within the course of a week, it kind of climbed from 100 milliseconds, which was already pretty high, to 250 milliseconds. What we do is that we look at the code. I mean, there was actually some caching issues. I mean, for, from the upstream code, I mean, we kind of pat, we patched it, do another packet and build and run, run Ansible, uh, and essentially, like, pretty quickly, the, we were able to solve this, and the API response time dropped to 25 milliseconds right away. So, and because we run a private cloud environment, we actually control all the operating system and what, does, what, does, what kind of software we run inside of VMs. Therefore, it gives us a lot of flexibility and visibility into what people are doing inside of their VMs. What we do is actually we simply coll install CollectD instance in all the VMs and then dump data into a Kafka queue. And then we run this camel's job, kind of periodically dump data from, from Kafka into HDFS for long-term storage and batch job processing. For example, we can do some weekly processing jobs to understand who has been using the cloud, what resource, et cetera. And we're also kind of experimenting with using Spark Streaming to analyze data from um, Kafka in real time. Um, but the good thing is that everything, like Spark runs on Hadoop, and Hadoop runs on OpenStack. So essentially, we're using OpenStack resource to monitor our OpenStack deployment. So this is actually a pretty interesting example, right? We recently started this query because we, since we use Ceph-based storage, I mean, this is all shared, everyone uses the same kind of pool of resource. So, what's, so we're trying to understand, okay, which tenant, who's like, which user are actually using, doing the most disk writes, right? So essentially this is a pretty simple query that trying to understand, okay, among a cost of a day, uh, what is the aggregated IO writes uh, in terms of bytes across different tenants? And obviously, this TS cloud data is our data ingestion pipeline. So, I mean, of course, it's going to consume a, a pretty uh, good chunk of disk writes. And then, I mean, the light blue one is actually an expected heavy user because it's actually a log collection application that ingests like all the log messages for the entire Two Sigma company. Of course, it's going to do a lot of writes. Uh, what is unexpected is there's, I mean, so basically this log collection, um, to give you some idea, the log collection application has actually have hundreds of VMs running in this particular um, deployment. What is unexpected is that there's another tenant with only two VMs running, and then they can actually, they actually consume more disk writes than hundreds of VMs combined. So what we found is that that's actually a pretty interesting application. They use a very specialized database, which do some fancy things, actually do a ton of disk writes. But luckily, that application already has like building HA so that they can live with local, locally attached disks. So we work with the application owner to migrate that application from Ceph-based disk to local disks, which actually give them better performance and actually free up like resource, a very valuable resource in terms of um, Ceph uh, for the rest of the uh, cloud users. All right. So, what's next? Probably rushed a little bit. Um, so the big thing next is obviously about performance. So we care, really care about performance. Um, there are, we want to kind of bring the, the performance in terms of compute storage and network to the next level. In terms of compute, I mean, there are a number of things from upstream that we, dis, that we kind of plan to leverage, such as the Numa Aware, um, placement, uh, huge pages, which will certainly help with, um, with uh, very kind of um, compute intensive jobs. Um, in terms of storage, we're actually looking at, for example, pure SSD based solutions to see how we can actually accelerate our applications. For network, we're already in a pretty good shape, um, but we also want to push like our boundaries to, let's say, get full line rate. I mean, we're kind of evaluating between, let's say, using DBDK-based acceleration or using kind of more full kind of off hardware offloaded solution. So we kind of 
hinted a little bit because, I mean, now we have the ability to track the actual usage of different, uh, different tenants and, and individual VMs. We want to start working on some kind of usage-based scheduling. So the idea is that you want to put VMs, you don't want to put too many hot VMs in the same physical machine, and then you want to kind of mix and match machines with kind of com like complementary workload on the same, in, the, in the same machine. For example, there might be a kind of intraday like trading analysis serve a VM, and you can probably put it on the same VM as some sort of post-trade analysis that only runs after trading hours. And finally, I mean, this is a big question, obviously, is container integration, right? I mean, there is, I think, a private cloud infrastructure is very nice in the sense that it give a kind of a complete operating system and kind of help with a very smooth transition from a physical infrastructure to a virtualized infra infrastructure. But container obviously has its own advantage in terms of like lower overhead um, and then kind of you can manage uh, a ton. You can manage sort of, I would say probably less um, orchestration overhead. So, uh, but I mean obviously there requi it requires some kind of modification for the application to live on a container-based environment. So, I mean, how do we kind of combine container versus, uh, with OpenStack environment is our kind of next big question to solve. All right, so I think I'm all done with five minutes left. I'm open to questions. Did you release any of the customization code you did for OV, uh, OVS? Uh, for OVS. Can you please repeat the question? Oh, sure. Uh, the question is that whether we release any customization we did for Open vSwitch. Uh, no, because Open vSwitch is essentially, we maintain the same abstraction. So essentially, we run the vanilla Open vSwitch plugin or ML2 driver to interact with Open vSwitch. Everything is actually done kind of at Open vSwitch layer. So it doesn't really kind of go into um, the OpenStack proper. We wanted to, but <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, my question's a bit around just the general, how did people react, management, when you just kind of came to them and said, we're going to do OpenStack and replace what we had? How did you deal with that kind of situation? Was it easy, smooth, or did you have a lot of... Uh... Um, I would say there's definitely a lot of resistance because people are kind of so... Hold on, holding on to their ideas, saying, okay, and then, uh, oh, I'm giving away my physical machines, right? I now have to use this crappy VM somewhere in the cloud, which I have no access to, right? But, I mean, again, I think it's more about, it's, it's a process, right? I mean, like I said, there's user engagement helps a lot. I mean, not all the application works well on the cloud, but every time we do work with individual clients saying, okay, if they have problems, we'll work with them, trying to understand whether it's a resource constraint on the cloud, whether it's their application design problem. So actually we do kind of help them to move to the cloud and that, that actually kind of, um, and overall kind of you actually build, make friends that way and then you, a lot of kind of naysayers become like cloud cheerleaders that way. Well, thanks. Thank you. Yes. Um, so the question is that before OpenStack, whether we use any te uh, virtualization technology? Uh, the answer is yes. So the, the build system that I mentioned actually um, can build not only physical machines and also virtual machines. So we actually started using KVM a long time ago. I mean, the problem with that build system is obviously is treating that VM with kind of like a physical machine. So essentially launch a VM, uh, have, attach it to a local disk, put it into a VLAN, and then sort of pixie boot and just like a physical machine. It still takes a few hours to build a VM, so obviously right now we cut it down to a few minutes, so that's certainly an improvement. Yes. So you described, sorry, you described SAP is a tricky implementation for you? I'm sorry? SAP? Yes. Can you describe a little bit more what is behind it and what's the expected response time you're getting from SAP? The performance? Yeah, performance. Uh, so right now we have, uh, so for every SAP cluster we deploy about 700 terabyte usable storage and uh, across 30 something machines, each one with six OSDs. And right now we can sustain about 20, uh, 22,000 uh, IOPS per second. This is just sustained. And we can actually peak to 75,000 IOPS without too much trouble. So it's, we actually have done a fair bit of tuning to make it to that level. What's the average response time? Average? 
It depends. I mean, there is the um, there are two types of latencies: apply latency and commit latency. Right? Apply latency is essentially how much how long it takes for Ceph to commit the make the commits into the in-memory caches. I mean, I think the commit latency is just constantly below one millisecond. Um, the commit latency is actually uh, slightly higher, but usually is under like single digit millisecond, I would say. Yes. How many people are on your team that supports this and sort of how do their skill sets break out? So we have a very large team, four people. Um, um, so um, we can do it. <laughs> so, um, but I, I think my, I, I really like my team. We have pretty diverse um, skill set. I mean, someone are responsible for kind of actually um, integrating the physical machines into this environment, and then some people are looking at more OpenStack oriented, and then, I mean, I recently kind of diverse a little bit to work on different things, so, yeah. 